Hello listeners we are back again with the second third episode of AI now hope you guys will love it we have with us today the professor dr emmanuel goffey director of the observatory on ethics and artificial intelligence at institute sapiens and mr brogdan grigorescu ai platform manager at combine intelligence we hope to have today a very fruitful discussion and I hope that the listeners will be as intrigued as I am and as excited about this as I am. So right off the bat, I would like to ask Abhivardhan sir to introduce you sir to the concept of international algorithmic law. It's over to you sir. Uh thank you so much Pradeep Pal for the introduction and let's start with the podcast anyways. Uh well <laughs> IAL or international algorithmic law is not uh i should say a created field for now but uh, it's like a proposition that i have given in one of my recent discussion papers and uh, the idea behind iaal is quite simple it simply means that while uh, there are corollaries and subsidiaries which are related to data protection and its control how it flows how it is protected how it is identified how its quality is maintained uh, there can also be an avenue where at this stage of algorithms this can happen however it's still a very nascent stage despite the fact that it's a nascent stage one thing is for sure that countries are reacting to it in their own way um one uh, aspect that we saw was the uh, ban of certain apps but i think the beyond uh, banning of apps there is a very brilliant paper by cornia bijola who had written for the uh, emirates this is the uae in january 2020 before the pandemic and in that paper she had discussed the diplomatic aspects of uh, algorithms how ai can contribute as a diplomatic sometimes it also affects diplomacy there's also a report by finland if i'm correct uh, i think diplo foundation report with regards uh, role of ai in uh, trade but i think beyond algorithmic trade algorithm accountability and uh, algorithmic policy which is i think one of the very interesting issues we can find in uh, today's lives um we can say one thing that this field is still developing so i'm not very conclusive here i'm being inferential in the sense that okay the field is in the development uh, but iaal is like in terms of how multilateralism should work it is a field which regulates how algorithmic activities will be defined and how algorithmic operations will be decided so it's very simple algorithmic activity simply means how apps use algorithms or any services or any particular physical uh, establishments use algorithms they are generic activities which are you know reasonable in a particular environment where obviously uh, it's quite urgent and this is of this or anything like that in, in a normal situation so i'm just saying in a normal situation operations is somewhere down the line might be related to issue of conflict law and legal or other steps but that too is something which is a very minute thing it is still under development therefore it is important at least to start a discussion on this i believe that <clears throat> it's a nascent area but once we get into it i will obviously discuss uh, some contours of my propositions also but i think we should start a discussion on understanding how ai you know affects geopolitics how geopolitics uh, admits the uh, role of ai in its own way uh, i think discussing that would be really a great thing to start with. so mr pal over to you yes thank you uh, so the next question goes to mr goffey sir what implication might the omnipresence of an artificial intelligence system have for the political environment and status quo of the world okay first of all thank you for having me here today uh, it's really interesting topic and i i tried to do my best to uh, um and to, to provide you with with uh, you know insightful uh, information about that uh, the first thing that i just want to 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 stress is that this status quo that you're talking about is pretty unstable actually the the stability of the international system is pretty unstable so uh, the point here is to just stress the fact that any kind of glitch even the smallest glitch that could interfere in this status quo uh, should be considered as a threat as a potential potential danger and uh, must be tackled as a, a danger right so obviously ai uh, as uh, one of the new tools of power that 
is growing today uh, must be seen definitely as a kind of a, of a danger uh, for the political uh, status quo if if there is any kind, kind of status quo of the world so uh, we should really have um, keep in mind that uh, artificial intelligence can be seen obviously as danger it can be seen as a benefit both of them right uh, we must not underestimate the risks of of um, of ai we must not overestimate them definitely but um, the implications are, are are basically numerous i would say uh, it, it's really hard to make kind of an exhaustive list of those uh, those implications but uh, Basically, the point is that we are now, and I think we will talk about that later, but we are now in a race uh, for AI uh, supremacy, right? And this will create tensions between countries. Uh, it's the case for any kind of race for, for, for power. Uh, we, we've already seen that in history with the nuclear weapons, but it, it's something that is growing now. Lots of countries are now racing uh, for AI. We, we know that the US is the leader in, in the matter. We know that China is just behind we know that india uh, tries to, is, is trying to uh, to get its share of that we know that the european union is doing so as well right and lots of other countries uh, are part of this of this race so the first the first big issue that we have here is the tension that can be created in this kind of ai race right for for power and we all already see that with uh, between the us and and china um the the uh, other point is that with AI now and the use of data and misinformation, we also have this big issue with you know the image of countries and 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 uh, the fact that you can undermine the uh, uh, the reputation of even a leader, political leader, or even a country at large. So this can this can also create kind of a mistrust between the people and the countries, but also between countries themselves, right? So when you try to collaborate in the international system, when you're trying to create trust in order to collaborate and to be more efficient at the international level, obviously AI can be used as a tool, as a Trojan horse to enter into uh, this system and just to uh, create misinformation that would definitely undermine this, this uh, potential collaboration. But uh, AI can be used at the international level in many, many uh, ways, right? It can be used in order to undermine the uh, uh, the national security. It can be used also to jeopardize the uh, uh, the military uh, the military system and, and lots of things. We we have to to be aware that uh, right now we are using AI in an extensive way, right? So we are really, really weak uh, because we are over dependent on AI, and this this situation will will be growing in the next. Um, decades or so and and we have to know that by creating these systems and by using them extensively we are creating weaknesses and those weaknesses will have definitely an impact if at some point someone is using them uh, on the international system so the implications are, are, are really numerous really numerous right and, um, and 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 we really have to be aware of, of that yes True, very true. Uh, to Mr. Bogdan, how far should the omnipresence and omnipotence of AI be allowed and how should it be regulated to ensure that the privacy of the global citizenry is not encroached upon? And what measures should be employed, if any, to make people all over the world acknowledge AI as a friendly tool and not a hostile entity? Uh, you know, it's a... Uh... It's a question of education, above all. Um, AI is not actually understood uh, by the majority of people, vast majority. It's, uh, it's really hyped, and hypes are very dangerous because they, uh, well, first of all, they're misleading. Uh, you, you know, silver bullet, one size fits all, AI can do everything and so on, not true. Um, AI taking over the world and so on, again, not true. Well, not in this stage anyway, and not in the next at least very few decades. Because what we have today, it's a very primitive form uh, in action. Um, So-called narrow AI. And even researchers are doubtful that the so-called general AI will ever be will ever be rich. Now, it's up for debate, but it's certainly not in the near future, for sure. 
Um, so the hypering is very dangerous, but to combat hypering, you need to understand more about artificial intelligence and in general intelligence automation, because this is not just about the technology. In fact, the technology, it's, a, it's one critical aspect of it, but there are a few other aspects of it, which uh, is the ethical aspect. It's the whole idea of artificial intelligence, which is not technological, it's a concept. Uh, and combating hypering, it's, it's critical. Uh, we've seen uh, what happened, for example, with the pizza gate uh, and the fake news and so on through social media. Uh, machine learning was, was behind all those algorithms, right? The, uh, and fake news uh, is a direct result. And so it's hypering. Fake news uh, can be a hype. Um, again, uh, over uh, stating what a technology or, or AI can do, or on, on the other hand, can instill fear, unjustified fear, even panic. AI will, uh, you know, rule people and, and things like that. Um, so education at all levels. This is not just the general public, of course, different level of education, uh, but also uh, legislators they have to understand a little bit more about uh, this form of automation and the technology uh, behind it. Um, government officials, people in the government and in governance, but also technologists have to understand more about the legal domain, how it is operating, how, how laws are, are made. Uh, I'm a technologist and I, I admit I don't understand enough about it, that's why I try to educate myself. Um, and also uh, the business stakeholders that use this or deploy this um, and sponsor this, they have to understand that by even by using it, you can have an impact. The, the way you use it is very important. It's not like opening a spreadsheet, but you know, what, what can happen? Uh, it is very different uh, and the impact can be spread in ways that nobody can foresee. Now, that impact can be positive and can be negative. But the thing is, there's a lot of unknown unknowns. So education is critical. Um, combating the hypes and don't letting the hypes develop, that's another critical aspect. Uh, we right now as we see we are in an ai wild west like almost anything goes if you look at it uh, almost uh, and we are drowning in masses of hypes um, which pushes science aside if you look at it uh, just to uh, to get on the bandwagon uh, even though most problems that business faces are not good use cases for any form of AI today. When I say most, I say numbers, not importance necessarily. Uh, and they can be resolved by, you know, what the businesses have in house. The hypering of it instill this huge sense of urgency that if we don't get on the bandwagon, we are left behind, which is not true. Uh, there are use cases where AI is very well suited, but the, they come with prerequisites. For example, if you're not on the cloud, you can't really uh, do any form of artificial intelligence because you can't scale, uh, and so on. Uh, and also, when it comes to the workforce, since this automation is way more effective than any other form of automation, that means the future workforce looks very differently. Uh, completely new skill sets will appear, and some of them already appeared uh, in the last two or three years, four years. Uh, others will be reduced, and yet others will just disappear. So it's important to have programs implemented for reskilling the affected wo workforce. Um, it will differ from country to country, but the idea stands true. 
uh, reskill. So, end of the day, there's no silver bullet and no one one size fits all. Um, but education, anti hypering, and programs for reskilling is what I'm I think are, are critical actions to be taken. And this is for the long term. This is not something that it started and say it's running for three years, five years, or ten years, and then it's kind of stopped. This is continuous. And why I'm saying it has to be continuous, i.e., a new way, way of living and new way of working, is because the nature of an artificial intelligence environment is continuous. It's it's not change is continuous and it's in this environment it's it's fast, it's frequent, and most above all, it's unpredictable. So a project starts but does not end. Uh, it's not even a project. I would call it an implementation or, or an initiative. Um, it just doesn't end. Uh, a classical project or program starts, develops, and then at some point ends after a period of time, shorter or longer. That's not happening with, uh, with an artificial intelligence implementation. It is very different. As I say, it starts, but then it's going to continue and developed in in different ways but is not going to stop and so because of that these new skills will continue to appear it's not going to be year after year but it's going to be continuous and the period between them that happened before but but the difference here is that this will be much faster than before it's not going to be a century apart or 50 years apart it's going to be quicker than that so the education efforts have to continue the uh, combating the hypes has to be continuous and the programs for less rescuing have to be continuous well he is to hoping that people don't associate arnold schwarzenegger with ai well uh, next question goes to avivardhan sir what might the consideration of AI as a juristic entity, be it plurilateral or multilateral, have in hold for humanity in terms of judicial decisions and social behavior? Thank you for the question. Well, in line with what our uh, members have discussed in this podcast, I very well agree that uh, the development of AI is nascent but uh, the propaganda and the information warfare to actually make ai ethics like monstrous or anything like that is just too much and it's overhyped as well as too much cancerous also because when information is shared in a bad way it doesn't help anybody so that is also true considering that i'll make my point in juristic entity so one thing is that we have some examples of AI as a juristic entity. Sometimes it has been made as a legal entity. I think few countries in the D9, maybe a few countries in Global North, uh, Global South, I'm not sure. Global South, I'm not sure. I think it depends because uh, in, in certain countries, it's like, it's not necessary. It is said, okay, define AI in a law. They sometimes say algorithmic systems. They sometimes say algorithmic services, something like that. I think in the California state, it has happened. Um, India does not ha do anything right now. I think uh, they have uh, made a drone law in 2018, but that is specifically related to drones, which is a kind of system. So drones are something which is very, very specific. So to be very fair, in the comparative constitutional context, there is no basic globalized definition of what is a juristic entity consideration for AI. Because a legal entity is simple. Under any act, under any judicial decision, under any international treaty, under any convention, you have a particular legal entity like United Nations, like, for example, it's a legal entity. Um, any company like Microsoft, it's a legal entity. But juristic entity is quite simple, uh, but in an obscure way, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a river can be given a juristic status. For example, I think in India, it has happened a lot. I'll share a very interesting example that, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of uh, historic connection with our temples and all. So there has been a very interesting case, the Ram Chandrabhumi case. So what happened in that case was that uh, uh, because uh, the, the very deity uh, whose temple is being now constructed after the Supreme Court decision, it was considered as a juristic entity. Now, the deity is what? 
physically you can say it's an object it doesn't represent itself like a human or obviously animals don't have that much cognitive and whatever capacity to do which means that it is a heuristic entity and it does not come within the rights duties liabilities and uh, responsibilities infrastructure of any constitutional democracy but the lawyers represent and their interpretation by the courts and the lawyers is done such a way so that as a heuristic entity they have a value so when we say ai as a heuristic entity one thing we can say that <clears throat> considering that my understanding of ai is in this way that it, it we can say ai is like the kinds of systems which use ai you know the its whole components they actually have various learning mechanisms of their own and they can represent like various aspects of animal kingdom they are like different species we can consider like that so in that sense ai being a heuristic entity is somewhere down the line a better way to start with not as a legal entity because uh, please remember a top to down legal approach doesn't succeed it always fails most of the time if uh, the implementation is not good and the infrastructure is not good and there is no clarity and no political consensus among any party any stakeholder so that is also always a problem i think uh, we have various examples around the world with proof this so being a heuristic entity ai can be based on what its characteristics can be more or less it is based on its technological characteristics now uh, we get some good examples from the european union uh, primarily but they are too much technocratic uh other than that i think uh, still it is under development now as uh, as bogdan very rightly pointed out that agi is something which will take a lot of time and i also agree now uh, bogdan is saying it will take decades my consideration is that agi will come in in 100 years or more because of the simple reason that first of all um, any ai system which needs to be a, a generalist ai in that sense needs to be all comprehensive and all capacitative like humans that is not the case with any kind of ai based system or automated system because first it's a data relationship secondly how much you comprehend and then even if you comprehend through the data and how it works and all the processing it still depends on how much you know what is the standard of being an agi so yes we can actually have some speculations uh, there is some research going on but it still doesn't mean because if we say agi of one kind then it can be a definition of a particular region of a, or of a particular ideological or technological thought, which i believe would not be appropriate because i think for countries it might be i'm not saying it's going to happen just saying that for and the understanding of responsible ai might change for example so the understanding of agi might also change it can happen uh, i don't think it has happened for now this fragmentation has not happened i think we see the similar trends when it comes to the controversy of having ai at its boards right in companies Uh, google tried to have its one in 2018 or 2019 if i'm correct and then uh, a whole lot of protests happened and then it got waved off they did not make any ai fix for so why it's uh, just like privacy policy and privacy policy things are like very static but ai fix board is something which is more related to the way the actions go so obviously it is related to trade secrets it's it's about how these uh, things work and obviously companies would be very reluctant to <laughs> actually uh, the market is that aspect and expose it so that is also a very important thing therefore yes a heuristic entity is a better option but yes consultative processes are important now let's get into the two aspects and then end this part uh, when i say in the multilateral aspect and then i would say in the plurilateral aspect it's very different so in the multilateral aspect we have various stakeholders we have uh, united nations we have oecd we have european union we have sarc we have uh, Uh, Shanghai Cooperation, we have ASEAN, we have all these multilateral bodies having their military and economic role wherever necessary. Beyond military and economic, I think I should say legal and political role also. But uh, with regards to how they actually implement the stuff, is something which is always a tricky question because yes, there are rules, but it's not necessary that the rules work all the time, and it's not necessary whether the mandate which is applied is reasonable with the reality. that is why it always is a problem for multilateral institutions like the united nations like the european union like the council of europe whenever they actually try to enforce a mandate i think we can start with any issue in politics international politics for that matter from iran nuclear deal to anything now the question is different whether it is good or bad i'm not going to question that whether uh, an, an administration is doing it right or not i'm not going to question that because that is something which is not the topic 
but we know that these trends will happen i think that's the simple reality i think there was one issue in 1992 with regards uh, human rights i think uh, there was some vienna conference in where two sides were created so one side was in favor of this same udh which is europeans americans canadians while the other side the other uh, uh, the other side of the il was the basically cultural relatives who were actually quite prominent about the same that you can't impose political democracy every time which is uh, and it was not india by the way it was actually i think the chinese and the bloc in central asia and the middle east iran turkey and all these countries why because they had their own concerns towards the multilateral aspects of issue human rights and its enforcement therefore uh, they actually brought cultural relatives but that is something also related to the issue of ethnocentrism right therefore in multilateralism the problems are, the problems are quite simple uh, it's important to enforce but the enforcement must be proportional uh, i uh, am not hopeful that uh, ai in a multilateral framework can completely be adopted because maybe for countries it might be a trade secret issue or it might be somewhere down the line something else so enforcing it just for the sake of it would not be reasonable and it is very important that the global south also encourages uh, the global north i think has some maturity of discussion um especially america and europe um china is in global uh, not due to the reason that it's you know can, can, it's actually in that sense because leaving the human rights issues and all that it's still economically viable so i consider china and global north but in global south you have africa asia pacific and asean and for that matter i don't think australia because australia and new zealand have a very good per capita income and all that so um, still global south does not have much that is something which we need to see i think it will take time to develop because uh, uh, in a multilateral scenario i think better discussions if happen then actually solutions will come currently there is no need to for a conclusive solution let it go for 5 years but some discussion must happen some growth must happen so this is a multilateral now let's get to the plurilateral part and then i'll uh, pass it on to you with the call in the plurilateral part the problem is and since we have said that okay countries will adopt their own frameworks for ai regulation as well as ai democratization there will be issues related to trade secrets there will be issues related to espionage um possibilities can come like uh, i think mr goki really uh, put a very interesting point on um, uh, i should say proliferation of nuclear weapons and uh, i think yes it is one case but beyond that also uh, it can be possible that um, countries can adopt some better strategies and some coercive or maybe some protectionist methods it can start from any country uh, that is a very important point like uh, i'll tell you how it uh, works so everybody knows that there is a controversy going on with an app known as tiktok right and india did ban that app now america has also said but i think the recent news which has come just today i've heard that oracle and tiktok are on a deal and donald trump has said yes so maybe they will delay the ban but the pretext of the ban that the indian government gave i will put that point and then i will explain why this new act thing is very important india has stated it because china used uh, i think uh, the world trade rules uh, the rules of gat i think so international trade law but that does not apply in a general sense because china does not give an open competition to other tech platforms like google youtube and all those in their own in its own territory so there are many concerns the the reason why india banned now there can be some legal issues i think they can be resolved also but the important thing which most of the uh, most of the people did not understand in the media and in the, the academic sector was that and i'm not i'm only talking about those who actually discuss this uh, that the ban of that app was related to the influence and the social control mechanisms as well as the secrecy issues with the indian state because the indian state is very bad in cyber security it's very not good although it's growing it's it is going to enact its cyber security policy very soon but still it is not that much strong like america and australia it does not have a good cyber security infrastructure like apple which means that obviously the indian state will have some repercussions now obviously that was resolved uh, with that we must understand that the problem begins with the simple consideration as how tiktok and so the issue is that these small apps these uh, these uh, 
services and products have a very important role in human lives. It affects geopolitics because it causes propaganda warfare, information warfare. And I think there will be one more term coming, which is known as metaphysical warfare. Why am I saying metaphysical warfare? Because uh, a very fugitive disparity is being created between real lives and lives, or lives in cyberspace, which is, I think, a very important thing to do, which is like, OK, due to lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, people consider anything in geopolitics to be of every concern, and then they start making anything. And I think that starts with also AI also, right? Uh, they don't read, they don't wish to read either. And they said, okay, okay, AI is related to this, this, this. It causes oppression and so, so, so. In reality, does it? We don't know, right? Uh, because, but yes, one thing is for sure that AI can actually cause some aspects of social control that we can prove using Facebook and Twitter only because social media as technology always influences opinions and everything. And obviously campaigns also for that matter political campaigns so that is why social control due to ai is possible but that is very very limited kind of uh, ai it's not that a very strong ai or you know not even within the contours of a narrow ai which is now getting to a strong AI. not not like that so it's like just some normal structures but as i said it's like a species it's like an animal kingdom i consider so we can think in that way therefore uh, it is very important that when plurilateral attempts are being made, it is very important that some clarity of discussion is there, some clarity of information sharing with regard to the approach at least is there. Uh, yes. And I think that would be a great thing. So I know end this. I'm sorry if it was long. I'm really sorry. I have a very bad habit to be very long. So middle part, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. So while we are on the topic of social media, in a world where we, uh, and this question goes to Mr. Coffee, sir. In a world where we come across so many social media influencers whose actions and words touch the lives of many people without any territorial or national constrictions, what might the political and social effects be if these influencers influence the people in a negative way, owing to negative propaganda caused by corrupt data sets in an artificial intelligence system or malicious algorithms created as propaganda machinery and how much of a threat can this particular phenomenon be considered okay the, the first thing that uh we have to keep in mind is that propaganda is definitely not something new right uh, so um, ai here must just be seen as a new tool uh that will help people to uh to to use propaganda or, or to influence others but obviously it's a really important and interesting tool tool in in the sense that it will make propaganda or influence uh faster and and, and easier to uh to uh to, to do right so uh i I'm really interested in the way that the constructivists are, are seeing that. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you're all aware or your listeners are aware of the constructivist perspective, but basically the constructivists are saying that uh, there is no reality outside in this world uh, and that the reality actually is shaped by the interaction that we have with um, our environment. People like Alexander Wendt or, or Nicholas Anna or even Thomas Lindman have, have been written, writing uh, extensively on, on this uh, on this point, and that's really interesting because uh, constructivists are actually showing how through speeches and and through words you can create perceptions, and those perceptions will uh, in turn uh, lead to specific behavior. Right, so it means that you can at some point control the behavior of people uh, through the speeches that you are providing them with. Uh, it's also something that you can find in the uh, in the concept of governmentality that has been developed by Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, uh, saying that at some point you can obviously um, uh, make people do what you want without using force, right? Uh, so you're just influencing them. So obviously now with AI and AI being being. I mean, uh, widely developed and used in the world, where not only at the state level but also at the in individual level, you can influence people. You can influence the way they see the world. You can influence the world the way they understand their environment, and obviously, you will influence the way the world behave. So, uh, basically, if you if you look at, for example, AI when it's used as a, an analytical tool, 
uh, you will base, if you're a leader, you will base your, uh, your decision making process on those analytics that are, have been provided by, by, uh, uh, by algorithms, by the AI driven tools. So obviously, if those algorithms are biased, your perception of the world will be biased and obviously your decision will be biased as well, right? So today with AI, the thing that is really important, really, really concerning, uh, to my opinion, is that you can reach uh, almost everyone that is connected. Uh, and obviously the Internet of Things here uh, is of uh, utmost importance because now, um, uh, I, I would not say anywhere in the world because that's not true, right? We, we all, all feel that um, the whole world is connected, which is definitely not the reality, right? But most of us, we are uh, connected all the time through our smartphones, our computers, our tablets, and even with other, you know, tools that we have now, even your fridge can be connected, right? So the point is that all the things that are connected are potential doors to individuals. And if you have those doors into the uh, everyday life of individuals, you can shape the way they will hack, the, 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 the way they will react to the world. This is exactly what is going on with the ads that you that you have uh, that you are having on on your computer when you are you know uh, navigating on on internet, uh, and you have this pop-ups that, that are saying, okay, you should go uh, in this place. That's a nice place for vacation, or you should buy this book or this computer or this or that uh, item. And, and actually, you are no longer using your own uh, will. You, you are influenced by, uh, by those algorithms and AI. The big, the big question, the big concern here is when this AI are used uh, purposely to make you hacked in a specific way, that would not be the way you would hack if you would not have this kind of influence, right? And and what it means is that at some point, and we've seen that obviously was the case in the US election, uh, you can obviously bring people to do something that would be uh, uh, that would be uh, counterproductive, that would be against their their interests. So uh, influencers can can be you know individuals as well, uh, and you know that because lots of especially the youngest generation, lots of people are connected on YouTube and they're watching those uh, videos about uh, the, this, those influencers that are explaining them the world. Uh, so obviously, uh, your perception and, and your vision of the world can be shaped by that. But it can also be influenced by, you know, uh, big tech companies. It can be influenced by states themselves, right? That will uh, that will try to. Uh, to bring their people or or constituencies of other countries to to do things that they um, that is in their interest and not in the interest of of the people. So the big issue here is, and I would just um, uh, add on this idea of the education. Uh, it, it's really of utmost importance that people would be educated uh, or trained on the AI ins and outs. They must be told that AI can be a potential danger, that we, we can have got a lot of, of benefits from AI definitely, but they must be, you know, uh, told about the potential uh, dangers of, of AI. We have to know about that because it's much more difficult now for us, all of us. I mean, whatever your age and the country you live in, uh, it's much more difficult for us to Made the difference, the difference between what is fake and what is true, right? And and, and with the technology uh, advances now, uh, lots of things you you've heard heard about the deep fakes. Uh, it's it's really really tough to to make the difference between uh, you know correct information and incorrect information. Uh, so we are all potential victims of of influence. But even when I say victim, that would be that need to be nuanced because we're not victim, actually. Uh, we are willingly accepting the fact that we will be influenced because we don't try to look, you know, beyond the words and beyond what we hear. We really need to be educated. So it's not a matter of just educating people. It's also a matter of people uh, willing to be educated, right, to, to know more about what they learn, what they see uh, in the world, and do not, and, and try not to, um, you know, uh, shape their perspective of the world only through what they hear and see here and there. You, you really have to, to be aware of that. So the big issue with AI in terms of influence today is that 
Uh, it's everywhere, first point, and especially through the IoT, but it's also more and more difficult to make the difference between what is true and what is fake. Yes, very true. Um, I think there has already been a few instances where uh, this pre-programming um, approach has been taken, like not only by AIs or uh, machines, but by humans as well. I think if I'm not wrong, uh, Mr. Bob Shapiro has uh, at a lot, a lot of times appeared on YouTube and made a lot of sexist comments even and uh, to which people who are well educated have agreed and uh, more so people who are uneducated have agreed. Now Bob Shapiro uh, was a part of the dream team that uh, acquitted OJ Simpson back when he was uh, charged with murder. Now people they think that when someone who is educated is saying something they must be right. And that is that point of relatability, I think, uh, stands as a problem at some points. Anyway, moving on to the next question uh, to Mr. Bogdan. With reference to developing nations such as India having poor economic conditions, how should the disruptive effect of AI be handled? Um, yeah, I'm coming back. That That's many elements here to, to talk about it as and many are common to uh, pretty much all countries, other are specific. I just want to reiterate the education and the hypering aspects. Um, education to uh, at, at all levels, as I said, uh, through different methods, and those methods will be specific to countries most of the time. You know, diversity matters. India, it's a hugely diverse country not just big but diverse so it, it's a complex society um, and so education though it, it it has the same principles is implemented in a different way than in a much much smaller country um, and combat of the hypering uh, you know we've seen um, there are plenty of influences um, Personally, I think that's not good because, again, it's pushing science sideways uh, to fit an agenda. Um, not all influences are, you know, subjectives and paid off and, and things like that. But how are you going to differentiate between them? The noise is it's deafening. Um, so, and, and that's an issue. Uh, imagine that when AI reaches the next level, uh, it's going to be unfixable. So don't push science aside, educate at all levels effectively uh, on the long term, I would say continuously and combating the hypes. It, it really is the most important aspect. Um, but they should not be taken in isolation. The infrastructure plays a critical role as well. Um, so own your own infrastructure. Um, AI cannot be effective. Any form of artificial uh, intelligence cannot scale without the right infrastructure behind it. And that's not just computing. Is you know infrastructure to gather and manage the data, uh, access to it. Uh, the networking aspect, and so back and so forth. IoT, for example, uh, Emmanuel mentioned IoT. They not gonna work without the the right networking behind it. Simple basic networking, uh, and this is not just bandwidth. It's performance as well. In fact, performance is more important than bandwidth when it comes to IoT because it has to be really, really, really low latency. Uh, I mentioned the computing aspects. That that's that, that's pretty obvious. Everybody think about that. You know, process, process, process. It's also the uh, the cooling aspect. Uh, all those huge thousands and thousands of data centers, they need cooling, effective cooling. Um, not sustainable with what we have right now in the long run. So it's a, it's a, it's the energy aspect, so the sustainability aspect, but also uh, 
the essentially maintain that that temperature and the humidity inside uh, it also have an environmental aspect uh, to it uh, and it's critical as well model in place today is not sustainable in the long run um, and so i would say india to keep control of its infrastructure because that IT infrastructure behind it is critical for artificial intelligence. You don't control it, you will not control the output at the end of the day, as simple as that. Uh, you will not even control the input because it goes into a feedback loop. What goes into an algorithm uh, influences the output of that algorithm and the output of one algorithm is input to another type of algorithm. It's very complex. Um, and it's always more than one algorithm that work. You, you can't have a, an effective artificial intelligence model that is using just one algorithm. It's going to be multiple of the, or different types, depending on the problem to solve. Uh, so it's getting to the point that it's unexplainable. The output of, of the model is unexplainable. But to be explainable, you have to own the infrastructure behind it. You know, the access to it, uh, where is it going in the future, in the next more than a decade, uh, very, very long term, and so back and so forth. Um, so education, combating the hypes, and own your own infrastructure. How is that to be done? I, I think uh, the people of India will know better. The, the, the uh, political forces uh, will, will know better than me. Uh, but these three critical elements is what I've seen. Okay, so uh, ne the next question goes to Abhivardhan, sir. Back to brass tacks. How are international relations influenced by algorithms? Okay, thank you, Lulpal. How were they influenced? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, there is no one answer to it. There can be some specific instances where you can find some media reports, some academic reports, and for that matter, some reports by governments. Uh, we can take some instances. We can say in this way that uh, algorithms was not the first to influence. It was in a follow-up that happened. If you say the history of technology, the history of human civilization in that very atmosphere. Algorithms didn't come in 1970s. They didn't come when Steve Jobs developed Macintosh. They didn't come in at that time. They come, they did come in the 2000s, you know, after the iPhone was launched and then computational intelligence was developing and many things are happening. When big data became a hyped reality. So if we say how it influences international relations, then still the influence is minimal. And I think that is fine because, because there are three aspects to it. Number one, there are three different revisionist political movements happening in the world. Okay. One is a contrarian movement. I don't want to wish, I don't wish to name which political ideological movement it is. One is quite cultural relativist. I think I've given the example of China, so cultural relative relativist. And the third one is civilizational transigence. I think so, if I'm correct. But let's see the three movements and then let, let's correlate it here. So when we say that information warfare was always a long term thing, fake news and propaganda have been since, you know, uh, since Alexander and since the Mesopotamian civilization, it's been for long. So I think don't think so that. Uh, fake news and propaganda has not been that but obviously it has been the problem that actually emerged and how it influenced international relations could be and this is my hypothesis i may be wrong i may be right okay uh, my hypothesis is that it influences i add in such it influences i add in such a way when uh, it actually was a common term and norm among the people that internet is all about our lives and that's where the problem begins as very rightly pointed out by our panelists, uh, 
internet yes has a very important role in our lives ai has a very interesting role in our lives not significant still because i think leaving a predictive uh, predictive systems and all that we still can say that yes there is some chance i think there might be disparities but the important thing which uh, actually manifested itself was when we started leaving our realities behind stop reading stop even thinking about what uh, the reality of discourse and i think it has a cognitive context as well uh, everybody knows uh, the cambridge analytica scandal and everything about it right uh, everybody links it with two events the 2016 us election and brexit but uh, there is one more important thing there that leave the propaganda campaign leave everything <clears throat> i don't think it was directly related to the hyper role of ai but it was more related to big data because in both the cases you will find even if the referendum was influenced which i believe it was i don't think it wasn't obviously propaganda campaigns do influence the influence was actually about a fraction fraction in the sense like you know a person b person c person so a is less than b it needs c so a plus c is greater than b it's like that so how it influences international relations is still very minimal it only influences the national contours uh, that is in a very interesting book by simon anholt uh, the good country equation recently released this year he discusses he discusses the same thing he, uh, he says that diplomats realize this that propaganda campaigns at a national level like anything for example i don't want to name what the propaganda campaigns are they work very effectively in india it can in the uk it can in uh, european union countries it can in usa it can but to globalize it globalizing is like this not even understanding that it has a national context or internationalizing it but yes recognizing it as an international it has a national context but still having more interventionist approaches is due to information warfare due to algorithms actually become reality but i don't say it's still mature it's still the same wagon it's still the same approach i can tell you from many instances when information warfare and algorithmic warfare not algorithmic warfare actually information warfare not algorithmic warfare it is nothing like that information warfare already happens right uh, we have instances from iran russia and china these three prominent countries which have been responsible uh, we have uh, some media portals we have some uh, other propaganda campaigns which actually involved i believe that some other countries are also doing it finally and unfortunately so yes it influences but very minimally but yeah it actually places a trajectory that is important that we can say that we can say because the constitutive aspect of international relations is still based on how actually the notions of power and competence are understood how actually the military and economic aspects of the world are understood it, it's not too much military i think so i hope so it doesn't still it depends i hope so it doesn't i think we are trying to i think that is with the global north countries that is with the pax americana blog that it's trying to make it a more economic uh, concern all that depends a uh, traditional warfare method still exist there's no issue with that i think i don't know um, that's something which i cannot answer myself because i'm not a person into that but i would say that yes uh, let's consider that thing, how nations do so yes at national level these propaganda campaigns influence international affairs. but linking it also is a counter aspect right so i think uh, uh, selling information and sharing information is like a bargain it's like a fish market it happens every time and this is something which is a natural thing to not stop it is impossible but to prevent it from causing anything worse is something which we can do this yes algorithms influence ir but not that much right now. however we must keep a check there are some basic things since in the information age we must always remember privatization and global capitalism endorses private actors more it in, in, it endorses the power of an individual on social media more than of a state it does not in, uh, endorse too much industrialization in that sense in that sense because industrialization requires centralization of state power that doesn't happen anymore which means that simply private actors have a very important role now the state actually takes a back turn uh we have some example where it does not happen like china like india like india pretends that it's privatizing or endorsing economic liberal liberalization 
but still it has very very weird uh, laws uh, recently i think the indian government is doing it but still um, the same is with uk the same is with eu so now when we are in the information age this will happen so in ir yes there is a civilizational context to this which i have made it clear that information age has a role so what to resolve i think we have discussed much about it and uh, in addition to this i will only say that since in information age this is a reality we must assure that it's not just the ai which is involved we should also make certain value chains we should also make certain um, i should say civilization aspects civilizational aspects with regards to the long term problems and also the short term issues to understand that everywhere you can't have you know notions of social control through disruptive technology that is a thing which we need to realize i think that is the same thing which is happening with companies and uh, people that they think everything can be resolved by ai everything can be resolved by algorithms and so uh home sweet home game over that's not how it works and that is the thing uh, technology's role is to advance human life to evolve humans right so in at a, in the civilization context it's still a very long road but yes since we say that at a national level it influences it can be internationalized globalizing it is still not possible i will tell you um i can give you one simple example a united nations is a good organization it has a good international structure it has some good values it was premised on the good values of international constitutional law but we know that the notions of political democracy imposed by america nato and un are still not been accepted by many countries in the sense you know the confederated countries and so so forth so yes good things come you have a technocratic understanding fine but at the same time let the things go on their way and try to harmonize it through better anthropological research and i will tell you if good anthropological research happens we can also see how the connection between algorithms data and human identity will be harmonized in a proper way and a real way i think that requires good research but if it happens then i think it will it will be good because it will help us also understand how we should take data and then i think we can have more uh, ethnographical methods so i would rest my case there yes um mr goffy sir what changes might the age of ai in its prime bring to the dimensions of warfare further how might an artificial intelligence system be weaponized for ulterior motives and also in order to prevent accomplishment of such ulterior motives in terms of defense sectors okay so um ai used in the military is uh, definitely a big issue right you've uh, all heard about this uh this concern um, about uh, what we call killer robots and there is a uh, um, a strong work that has been done by NGOs to you know to to uh, i mean fight against the development of the, of such um, uh, weapons but at the same time uh, even if the intention is really good uh, my my perception is that uh, we uh, we are already into this uh, once again race uh, to uh, weaponize the AI fitted system military system. Um, uh, pretty concerning, obviously, but uh, also at the same time, uh, you certainly know that there are lots of you know financial and, and diplomatic and power uh, interest at stakes behind those uh, those issues uh, regarding the uh, uh, new weapons that are developed here and there in, in some countries, not all around the world. Once again, uh, there is kind of an inequality in terms of uh, the uh, the skills and and, and uh, the means that we have to develop these uh, these weapons, but. Some countries uh, are obviously developing this kind of of, um, of weapons. Um, the big issue that we have with this this weapons is that uh, uh, there is a debate on the fact that they will there would be a revolution in the military, uh, uh, you know, uh, perspective or, or only an evolution. Um, I, I do not see that that's really debatable, obviously, but I do not see any kind of revolution. This this word is overused and um there is no revolution at all you know you remember that in the 70s 80s there has been this concept of the rma which is the revolution in military affairs saying that uh, we are now using more and more you know technology in in, in our uh military affairs and and that they'll 
this would lead to some point to uh, less casualties, to kind of cleaner warfare and this kind of things. But what we've seen is that uh, actually war, the nature of war, and that's really Klauswitz in perspective, the nature of war is still the same. And all the tools that you're using are just here to enhance uh, your power or, or your ability to, uh, to win in warfare, but they will not change the face of warfare. So. Uh, AI will not change the face of warfare, and we can see that now uh, because with the RMA, we thought that with technology we would be, uh, uh, you know, much more efficient and once again causing less casualties, less suffering. Uh, but um, conversely to what we thought at the beginning, what we've seen is the development also of, you know, a much more basic warfare and, for example, terrorist groups and and. We have to keep in mind that war, whatever the tool that are available, uh, war is a matter of human beings fighting against human beings, right? There is this, uh, you know, this uh, dream or myth about uh, robots uh, fighting against each other. Each other that, that doesn't make sense, right? That doesn't make sense because when you when you're conducting a war, what you want is that your for your adversary will suffer enough to at some point say, okay, stop. Uh, I surrender, and because because you know the suffering is too uh, too harsh, and and my people uh, cannot deal with that. So uh, making robots fighting against each other would be certainly maybe the first step, but at some point human beings would need to uh, go on, on the field and, and fight at, uh, uh, in turn, and so. Uh, I don't see AI being kind of a really game changer in, in terms of warfare. Yes, obviously, uh, decision making processes are, are now faster than they were before, but even that can be seen as a benefit. But uh, it also raises the question of uh, our ability to deal with that as human being, right? When you are, you know, uh, overwhelmed by data, by information all the time, the question, the big question is, are we able to, you know, to process all this information and all uh, this data? Uh, are we able to make decisions based on that? And and obviously the the answer is no, we are not. So we will obviously delegate this uh, this ability to algorithm and AI that will make decision uh, for human beings. This is the big issue that we have with. Uh, I, I've been in the military for for 25 years uh, before I left, and and actually what I've seen is the the, the wording of all that has changed slowly from, you know, human uh, in the loop towards human outside the loop. Uh, and what it shows is that actually the belief that we are still in control, that we will remain in control, uh, is just a myth, just a dream, right? Or just a communication tool that we are, uh, you know, providing people with in order to make what we're doing legitimate and to may maybe reassure them about uh, what will be uh, the future of warfare. But um, the big point is that uh, AI is a tool. We have to be uh, really concerned about the fact that at some point those systems and this kind of AI could lead to autonomous systems. When I say autonomous systems, I mean systems that could make exactly the same things are as human beings are are currently doing. So I know that a lot of people are are saying or stating that it's just sci-fi that they just you know wipe that out, uh, uh, saying okay it will not happen or it will not happen in the uh, short term. Uh, but that's not the question. The question is that is it possible that at some point autonomous weapon could uh, be developed, could exist, and could you know take. Uh, uh, take the lead over human beings and and the answer yes even if the probability is really low we cannot we cannot afford just swapping it out and, and saying that it's only science fiction and we don't have to to deal with that we don't have to address the uh, the situation one of the, the 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 concern that i have today is that uh because of the uh financial, diplomatic and 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 once again power interests that are behind these ai tools uh, apply to to military uh, uh, affairs is that we are not really really assessing thoroughly the uh, the uh, the consequences of this kind of weapons and so we are developing them in kind of an anarchic way right this is where NGOs are doing a great job just trying to say okay we should maybe stop uh, for a while and and try to have a legal framework for all those systems, right? And once we have those safe words clearly set, 
then we can, you know, go on developing these systems within this very, very uh, rigid um, uh, framework. Uh, so far, what I've seen is that states are not really interested in being constrained by by law uh, when it comes to uh, developing this kind of, of AI uh, uh, fitted weapons. Uh, and so the concern is much more about the anarchical, you know, uh, uh, way it is developed and the use of AI itself, right? Um, whatever you use in warfare, it's it's not acceptable. But here, AI will not revolutionize warfare at all. It will not do that. It will be just the evolution of what has been done throughout uh, ages uh, about the use of technology and much more technology all the time. So AI must be a concern in terms of the autonomy that we will provide those weapons with, right? And we must not deny the fact that there is this possibility that at some point uh, AI will have the same cognitive uh, abilities as human beings, right? Nobody, and that's clear, nobody can state now, right now, that it's something that is impossible. You can say that it will not happen within 10 years, 20 years, that's okay. But you cannot state you cannot say that it will never happen, that it's just sci-fi, right? We were talking about Terminator. Uh, nobody can tell now that Terminator will never happen, okay? You can say that, okay, that will happen in 100 years. I don't know, I don't know. But even if the probability is one uh, out of 100 or one out of a billion, you have to take into account and you have to think about it. And this is where... Um, I think we are weak. We don't want to do that, right? It takes time. Uh, it's really hard to do. And we are much more focused on, you know, short-term advantages, and especially in the financial uh, side of it, uh, than in the impact on the long run. So this is where I see uh, uh, the issue uh, of, of a weaponized system that could be fitted with AI. Okay. Um, so, uh, sir, do you think there will be a particular benefit in minimalizing uh, the amount of friendly fire that we incur if uh, a proper AI can be deployed, if not used as a weapon? I, you know, I think minimizing the uh, the casualties uh, is 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 a beautiful dream, right? But war is not about that. Uh, I, I would say that it. Once again, it's it's really sad to say that, but that's the the. Uh, uh, that's the truth uh, when you are conducting a war. The point is not to minimize the suffering on the other side. Uh, conversely, it's it's to increase the suffering because at some point what you want is that the people will be just fed up with this kind of suffering and they will put pressure on their uh, on the government, on their state to stop the war, right? What you want is to win. When you start a war, you want to win, right? You, you're not doing humanitarian things. Uh, humanitarian war does not exist. That's just a concept, right? So when you're conducting the war, what you want is to win. So if you want to win, you have lots of tools. And among those tools, there is the suffering that you will impose on the people on the other side. Uh, because you know that it's a really huge incentive for them just to say, OK, stop. We, we, we can no longer uh, bear that. And then and we have to, st to stop the war. So. Um, Yes, obviously there is a, a, a strong work that has been done by the uh, international system in terms of the laws that have been developed and, and the uh, the counts the the the, uh, the values that have been you know uh, supported in order to minimize the suffering of the people. But at the very end, what we see and 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 once again, I'm French and I uh, I can see uh, the French people fighting in Mali. I can see the French people in other countries fighting in Afghanistan. It's not about minimizing the sufferings. Uh, that's just political speeches, that's just communication tools, because we do not, uh, uh, we, we do not, I mean, we're not able to accept the responsibility of what we're doing. When you are conducting a war, whatever you do is unacceptable, right? Uh, in, in terms of human suffering. So minimizing doesn't mean anything to me. Okay. So the next question goes to Mr. Bogdan, sir. What are the factors that decide how the informational ecosystem shall be changed or perhaps reprogrammed by the advent of the age of artificial intelligence? Um, standards, ethics, regulation, education, it's ones that they're all, they're all very much complementing each other. So a grid standard, 
uh, I mean by standards, agreed internationally, uh, similar to the um, international system, uh, like the metric system, for example. Um, the time is measured in the same way. The definition of the second uh, is uh, agreed uh, across the world and everybody measures the, the time in the same way um, and so on. So standards so that everybody's aligned and they measure the same thing in the same way. Uh, ethics, we, uh, we talked a little bit about it. It has to be at the core at all stages. Uh, in a in an AI environment, from conception to building it, to deploy it, to operating it, to using it, at, and and all the elements involved. It's the algorithm, of course, but it's the data, uh, it's the process around it. How change is managed? What kind of changes are, are going live at at high level? I'm talking about not at microscopic level because that will differ. But for example. Uh, Phase recognition. I've seen an example of you know mask detection, because maybe in some countries it's mandatory by law to wear a mask in the COVID-19 uh, situation um, in public. So to detect that, to see you know are people abiding by it, and if they not, find those that uh, flout the rule. But the thing is, you're not really detecting the mask, is it? you detecting, you IDing the person because you can't just see the mask and a little bit around it. You see the whole body, definitely the eyes, the retina and so on. Um, passport control, that's uh, retina scanning, um, you know, especially when the visa is required and so back and so forth. You see, you see also the people that are next to that person. Um, so it's not really mask detection. That's only part of it, but it's really IDing people. Should that be legal? That's a question to ask. Uh, so regulation comes into, into play here. Um, but also if somebody is a, is a case of mistaken identity because of an output of some algorithm and some machine learning model, uh, and, and they have a criminal record as a, as a result of it, they should be able to challenge that decision. The problem is intellectual property plays a role. The regulator may say, well, the company that produces these models uh, invokes intellectual property rights, commercial secret. And so your rights as a human being come second, for example. That contravenes international law, is it? but it contravenes only if there's regulation about that right now there's no regulation that they can say that and that was a case in in us i think in wisconsin exactly about this the person accused could not have insight into how that decision has been reached now the the judge couldn't tell them because they didn't know they just had the output and how was that produced it was a secret commercial secret um so <laughs> you can't really i mean your human rights are, are breached right uh, and again education you cannot have effective regulation and you can't even talk much about ethics and definitely not you know understand standards and device standards if people are not educated generally speaking at, and there's different levels of education um of course, uh, we also have to understand that new new ways of working uh, will be in place. They are already started. This is not they are already here with us, but this is just a start. Things will be done differently. Uh, people will interact differently, and so on. Uh, and understanding the importance of data. You can't really touch data, is it? It's it's a it's it's more of a concept, but that has direct impact on all these automated systems. It's the fuel. So everybody should be understanding how critical the data is. You know, their personal personal data as well. And that personal data can be found in 
unexpected places. The moment you send an email, you leave a tra trail. Uh, it doesn't mean it's dangerous, but you have to understand how important that is. Uh, so understanding the importance of data by the end user, by the people developing these systems, uh, by those devising processes around it and financing it um, is critical. So the so-called data-driven, data-driven uh, type of organization. Uh, but even in personal life, you have to understand you put, you have a smart meter, somebody, and you don't know who that somebody is, will know about your consumption of energy. Do you really want that? You are out on holiday, you're not consuming, somebody will, will see that. Are you comfortable with that? You have to ask yourself that. It all comes from the data. Uh, and these, I would say, are the main pillars uh, in the decision-making process. Um, make it a little bit more transparent and, and people to have the means to challenge it in a court of law if they're affected by it. But again, based on regulation, not challenging it uh, because they can, but challenging because uh, they have the right to do so. And there's a legal framework around it that uh, levels uh, the playing field for everybody. Um, that's what I would say it's the most important. How, how to do that? It, it will differ from country to country, but it also has to be uh, following international agreed standards. All right. So uh, we have had a really great talk. So the last question to Mr. Goffey, sir, is bearing in mind that one of the factors that influenced the Second World War was a race for superior weapons with news of great investments being made in China, USA and Israel towards the development and deployment of AI. Do you think that a mad scramble for power in terms of AI is set to begin soon? And if so, what are the chances of this scramble dealing the same amount of devastation to humanity as once the race for nuclear weapons did? Okay, so uh, that's, uh, I would say that that's kind of an easy question because uh, the race is already there, right? Uh, uh, it's not something that we can foresee. It's something that is already there. Uh, if you uh, if you look at what's going on on the international uh, scene, you uh, you you see and you, you you know we all know that there is this race uh, already there between uh, obviously uh, uh, the U.S. and China, but not only, right? Lots of countries are part of that uh, definitely. And uh, if you look at the global AI index, you will see that more than 50 countries are now in this race. So um, what you call the mad scramble for power is already there, right? And we have we have to deal with that. Uh, once again, uh, it depends on, on your perspective on international relations. And you know that as well as I know it. And there are many theories about uh, international relations system. You can be a realist, you can be an idealist, you can be a constructivist, uh, even if it's not really a theory. Uh, but if you're a realist, which I am, uh, at some point I would say that uh, uh, the uh, the race for power is, is, is kind of uh, in the nature of international relations, right? So uh, uh, whatever the kind of tool that you can use in order to reduce power, you will use it. And AI is definitely one of those tools today. It's uh, it's an object of, of international relations and, and lots of countries are fighting it uh, in order to be the first, to be the leaders You've uh, you've obviously heard about the um, uh, the uh, the policy paper that has been released by the uh, Chinese government in 2017, saying that uh, uh, China wanted to uh, uh, to be the leader uh, and, and and to uh, to quote the, the text uh, to be uh, the commanding gates of artificial uh, intelligence by 2030, right? Um, in the same vein, you've heard about uh, Vladimir Putin saying that uh, uh, whoever would uh, would be uh, the master of AI would 
lead the world, right? Uh, and and um, and you've seen a lot of other countries, right? Uh, I'm, uh, I've been living in Canada for for a while now, and uh, Canada is the first country that has actually issued uh, a uh, AI strategy, and and just behind that, thirty countries have done exactly the same. The European Union is doing the same, right? So this race, this this uh, this mad scramble for power is already there. Uh, the the point was was this kind of thing is that obviously that can be really nice outcomes of it. There can be benefits if this uh, competition is made uh, in in a smart way. But we all know that it's not. Uh, about being smart at the international level. The point is that uh, you want p power and uh, in a very Machiavellian way, you will do whatever it takes to uh, to, to reach the, the point where you will be the most powerful of, of all. So um, uh, when we're talking about, um, you know, weaponized system that would be fitted with AI, that's one of the big issues that we have and that one of the, the big concern that we have about the future of, of international relations. Uh, it's not the only one. Maybe AI will be used in ways that are really unwanted or uh, are undesirable, but uh, we know that uh, it's all about the international system. The, the difference be between the nuclear uh, race is that I would, I would say, but what's, once again, it's fully open to debate, I would say that nuclear weapons, um, we all, almost all, uh, identified the risks of it. We know what nuclear weapons can do. And at some point, I would say most of us are really um, scared by nuclear weapons. We don't want it, right? We, we uh, I mean, at the international, at the maybe the political level, nuclear weapons is something that is really important, obviously, because it's uh, it's a tool to to ensure your defense. But uh, for the rest of us, as, you know, basic citizens, uh, we don't see in the nuclear weapons something that is desirable, right? And that's where the big difference is with, with AI, because AI, we see it as something desirable, because we don't truly really see, we don't clearly see what the what the risks uh, are exactly. So, um, uh, so it can be much more dangerous. AI can be much more dangerous. I, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of, you know, this kind of uh, um, futuristic uh, perspective on devastation of humanity. Uh, that, that, that's something that could happen. Once again, you cannot, you cannot deny it. Obviously, at some point, um, you know, AI systems could take the lead over human beings. At some point, they can just, you know, destroy humanity. I don't know. I don't know. That, that's something possible. I don't know when. Um, I, I, I hope it will happen uh, uh, in, in, in hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, but the, the big issue is that AI is much more insidious. Uh, than nuclear weapons are, right? Nuclear weapons is, you, 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 we know is the, the bombing of Hiroshima and exactly what, uh, what nuclear weapons can do, right? But we don't know yet what AI can do. Uh, so you get um, a lot of, of uh, you know, um, polarized debates about that, saying on one hand that uh, this idea of, you know, autonomous systems is, is sci-fi, and on the other hand, saying that we have to be aware of the risks of, you know, what we call the uh, Terminator syndrome. Uh, so maybe the, 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 the truth is somewhere in between, but uh, we, we cannot see clearly everything is really fuzzy about AI. We have, we have lots of discourse, lots of speeches, that are shaping perceptions once again of people and and we don't clearly see uh, what is at stake um we only know that at some point it's really appealing right but like ai we have that in our smartphones we're using ai all the times right and and uh, um, uh, even firms are using ai for lots of things right and lots of 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 our activities are relying on AI today. So it's kind of appealing and it's at some, at some point it's also scary. So we're still in the, uh, in this, um, you know, uh, in, in, in this situation where we are not really aware of the potential risks. And, and even when you are aware of the risks of AI, you get a lot of political speeches, once again, and, and a declaration that are saying, okay, look, you, know, you don't have to, uh, to be, um, and to be scared by that, you have to trust. That's the big word now. That's the buzzword today. Uh, you, have, you have you have to trust us. You have we are developing this kind of trust for AI, which doesn't make sense. Okay, because AI cannot be trusted. Human beings can be trusted. AI cannot. Uh, but at some point, 
the risks the risks are higher in the sense that AI is much more insidious. Is already there and uh, it's growing in its uh, uh, ability to, you know, make decision or, or to influence us in making decision or behaving in uh, in this or that way. Uh, so this is where I, I see something really uh, concerning. And the other way uh, that um, that AI can be concerning also is you know this mix between human and nations, right? And uh, uh, we we all uh, we uh, all talk about the uh, once again Terminator syndrome, but I would also talk about the Rebocop syndrome or the Iron Man syndrome, right? And just this kind of mix between uh, human beings and machines, which is something that is ongoing right now, right? And 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 I feel like that in the near future, um, uh, being a human. Uh, will be something that will be really, really hard to define what, what, what it is to be a human being exactly. So uh, nuclear weapons, once again, yeah, that can that could definitely uh, lead to uh, uh, to the annihilation of of, uh, of the of the humankind. But uh, in another way, AI could do that. Nuclear weapons is clearly identified, and we are scared of it. AI is not clearly identified. We don't even know what AI is exactly. And so it's not scary. It's uh, in between, you know, uh, uh, once again, uh, scary thinking about the future of, of, of uh, human humanity being led by, by robots. And on the other side, you know, all the benefits that we can withdraw from, from AI and which is true. So this is where I see um, a big concern, and, and once again, I, I would I would insist because I do agree. I really do agree on on what Bogdan was saying about education. It's a matter of education, right? You, it's not only about educating people. It's also about uh, people willing to be educated, right? You have to be educated. You have to learn. Uh, it's it's obviously not the only uh, solution, but it's it's what it's part of the solution. If you want to avoid this kind of situation, you have to be educated and. And then you also have to ask yourself, what kind of society do I want for the future? Uh, what is my responsibility when I'm developing or using this kind of tools today? What is my responsibility as a citizen when I, I'm asking for more and more apps on my cell phone? Uh, what is my responsibility when I ask for more and more apps on my computer and this kind of things? Because there is a market behind that, right? So when I'm when I'm uh, I'm ready to buy and when I'm even asking for much more technology. I'm obviously part of this big system. I'm not a small cog of it. I'm a big cog of it, and because I'm, I'm just asking people to develop new tools that will be used at the very end in a way that is maybe unforeseeable or, or, or uh, uh, unwanted, right? Uh, so AI is here. It's it's already here. Uh, we don't really understand that. We're not really aware of that. We're not really aware of what uh, is hidden behind that. Uh, you know, um, if, if you look once again at the global AI index, you will see that uh, 10,000 artificial intelligence companies have been founded since 2015. It means that there is a market, right? There is There are strong interest but behind that. Uh, private actors have, have been funding at the height of $37 billion. So it means that there is a lot of investment in that. A lot of people are, are, are creating this um, this environment and this environment because this is the title of this podcast is becoming the new normal right and ai is becoming the new normal we all the time hear about those robots that will help us in doing this or that a that that will um, uh, help us to uh, for in in, in the uh, in the field of agriculture and in, in the health industry and yes obviously ai can be used in that way but we all know that at some point AI algorithms and all that has been developed in the civilian uh, industry will be used uh, for purposes that are that are unwanted purposes. So once again, the, the fact that it's really insidious is much more concerning, uh, on my opinion, than and then the use of nuclear weapons. Well, we as humans are always afraid of anything that we can't perfectly understand. So as all good things have to be ended, so is this discussion. Uh, we'll be ending it now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bogdan Grigorescu. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel Goffey. Thank you, Abhivardhan, sir, for letting me have this podcast. It's been delightful. And thank you all for enlightening us. Thank you. I hope the listeners will love it. Stay tuned for the next episode. We'll be back.
Thank you, Brian. Thank you.